All right, it looks like it is 3.15 and we are set to go. Hi everyone, I hope you have had a wonderful, wonderful day so far um, at the summit. And if this is your first session, you're in for a treat. My name is Stephanie Sabatini. I'm a disability rights advocate with the Disability Law Center of Virginia. I have blondish brown hair, a pink shirt on, and my background is the 2023 summit background. Um, my pronouns are she and her. Thank you for joining today's session. Today's session is entitled, Nothing About Us Without Us, How to Advocate for Yourself. Um, today's speaker is Christina Brookman. Christina is a wonderful self-advocate, and she has been so great to work with um, through her time with DLCV and all her engagements. And I am so excited for her to share her story today. Um, but before we get started, there are just some housekeeping rules that we would like to address with you all. Um, first things first, Christina's materials for this presentation are available on the platform. So you can access them while she's presenting or even after. Uh, speakers, please remember that we are using live captioning and interpreting services. So when you first introduce yourself today, whether it be as a speaker or a participant later on, please include a physical description of yourself and your pronouns. An example is, I'm an African-American woman with curly black hair and glasses. I'm wearing a red blouse and have the DLCV Summit blue background. My preferred pronouns are she, her. Doing this will help provide context for all attendees and also help interpreters and captioners locate who is speaking on the screen. Also, please stay muted at all times unless you are the speaker and please hold all questions until the end. We do have a chat box that will be monitored. This chat box is used for questions only or as directed by the session speaker. At the end of the session, moderators will select some questions from the chat box. If your question is chosen, you may take yourself off a of mute and ask your question or simply type your question in the question box. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Ms. Christina Brookman for self-advocacy panel, Nothing About Us Without Us. Hi, thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm really excited to be here and honored to be here. I love DLCV. Um, they've uh, been a very important part of my life over the past nine years. Um, I have, uh, I'm a Caucasian female, uh, long brown hair, blue glasses, and a blue dress. My background is a splattered blue uh, paint uh, with the logo of my podcast, Speaking in Spoons, the Chronically Ill Podcast, which is a microphone with dancing spoons. Um, I have a video that I'm going to play for you. So let me get to that. Hi, my name is Christina Brookman, and I am disabled. I'm a self-advocate, a disability advocate, and host of Speaking in Spoons, a chronically ill podcast. And I'm here today to speak about self-advocacy. So let me uh, transition to a little presentation I have. So I've titled this Speaking in Spoons um, because of my podcast, Speaking in Spoons, a chronically ill podcast. Um, I have, I started with invisible disability um, and that has progressed to visible disability. I have chronic illnesses and rare disorders. So it's been quite a battle um, and quite a journey and continues to be. 
Getting a diagnosis, I think, can be um, one of the most difficult things for people with disabilities, um, especially um, chronic disabilities, um, rare disorders. A lot oftentimes, um, what we think of as rare disorders, um, there are quite a lot of people out there that have them. It's just they're um, misunderstood. And so I had to learn a bunch of things um, on my journey of getting diagnosed that I'd like to share with you. Um, I truly believe that self-advocacy is education. It is about educating yourself. It is about educating others about your disorders um, and also helping the world um, understand not just about your disorders, but about your needs. That's educating them as well to your needs and advocacy. Um, so whenever I go to a new doctor, I have a new doctor packet. Um, I make a timeline. I'm, I'm extremely OCD. You'll learn from this. But I make a timeline of my symptoms. You know, when did I start feeling things? You know, at what age? And um, maybe if I notice anything happening around it, a lot of doctors will ask you to do this. So this is something that I learned to create. But also, um, by the time I got to a geneticist, um, I, I took what I did for the geneticist and then applied it to all of my other new doctors moving forward because it really helped me um, with the geneticist. So um, the timeline of your symptoms and then also separately break down your symptoms by body system, um, cardiovascular, uh, neurological, um, endocrinological, uh, endocrinological and, and this is one of my symptoms, difficulty speaking and uh, brain fog sometimes. But, um, you know, your endocrine system, are you having hot flashes, things like that. And you may separate it and put it in a wrong category. And that's totally okay because it's create your own category. So whatever works for you to help communicate to your doctor what you are experiencing. And I think this can also really help uh, parents um, of children or an adult that are on the spectrum um, and, you know, parents of children on the spectrum. I was talking to a woman the other day whose grandson, who she cares for, is autistic. And um, the way he um, feels things and then describes how he feels things at first didn't quite make sense to her until she understood I got a little bit more detail, but it's helping break that down. Once she understood, oh, it, it feels like I'm being pulled um, through gravity. She, The doctor helped her understand he was feeling all of the sensory, you know, of his stomach moving, you know? So kind of just breaking down those things helps your doctor understand you and your experience. And don't forget, you know your body better than anybody. Um, the next thing I created was a caretaker cheat sheet. Um, and I keep that with me. I have it in my purse. So no matter where I am, there's a copy with me. Right now, I live with uh, on the second floor at my mom's. I've got one posted on the second floor in my room and the other room up here. I've also got it on the fridge downstairs for her or for the EMTs whenever they have to be called. And on that cheat sheet, it's got my name, my birth date, and my address. It's got my medical power of attorney and my emergency contacts name and numbers. It lists my conditions. It lists my doctor's names, the condition they treat me for, and their number. Um, it lists you know, uh, instructions for the ambulance, like uh, hospital prep prints, things like that. Um, it lists all of my medication and allergies, alphabetical order. So that's two separate things, um, allergies and the reaction. And then your list of medications in alphabetical order, 
name, dose, and the reason you take it. Because a lot of people for medications, you know, it may have an FDA, um, this is what it's used for. But let's say like gabapentin. It is a seizure medication. It is also a pain medication, and it's also a mood stabilizer. So it's very important that they know why you take this medication, because they could just assume that you take it and have a condition that you don't. Um, also, your medication schedule, um, the time and the dose, and keep that alphabetical as well, um, and preferred pharmacy. And you're like, Christina, this is really, really OCD, but this has saved me. Um, and it's also my doctors and my nurses love it uh, because it really helps them when I go there. You know, I have like 12 to 14 medications. So this way they're not like looking at just like a paragraphs of blobs of stuff. They can immediately see things. And it's organized and it helps them help me because they have very limited time to see me. So if you're helping them, you know, ease up some of that time, then you're getting better quality of care as well. And that's you advocating for yourself. Um, I also do a special sheet of a list of special instructions for in case of emergency, like with my migraines. Um, like I said, it looks weird. So I do have an emergency pill that can be given to me. I also don't regulate my body temperature, which is part of my POTS or dysautonomia. It's also part of the migraine. I have ice hats. They look like little blue smurf hats and we keep them in the freezer. So letting people know ahead of time, hey, if I start not being able to talk, if I'm if I'm red, if I'm looking a little funny, go get a, an ice hat, put it on me. Um, maybe elevate my feet, ask me yes or no questions. Because with yes or no questions, I can do thumbs up, I can do thumbs down, even if I can't talk for myself, you know? Um, that's what I've worked for myself, thumbs up, thumbs no system. People that care for me know if I can't do thumbs up or thumbs down, that's when you call the ambulance. If I'm still able to do this, I'm good. Um, but if I can't, that's when you call the ambulance. So giving them those tools to help you um, helps make sure that you get taken care of the way you need to be and want to be, and that you're a part of that process even when you can't be. Um, make sure you have an evac emergency evacuation plan. Um, this was something I hadn't thought of until my friend, who's a part of emergency um, plans in, um, in Richmond, was like, Christina, do you have an emergency evacuation plan? You're on the second floor. And I was like, oh, that's a problem. Um, you know, so coming up with those systems, uh, when we didn't have the uh, chairlift working, we were like jerry-rigging different ways to get me things up to the second floor and down. You know, if I have to sit on my bum and scoot down, or there were oftentimes I would be up here for weeks at a time, you know, and people would have to bring things up to me and bring things back down. Um, and I was like, man, like we could really use a dumb waiter at this point. Um, get to know your neighborhood firehouse. If you have um, any uh, different kind of conditions, and I say different because I have different kind of conditions, but, you know, with anything, if you need specialized care, it's always a good idea to go talk to your local firehouse and apprise them of the situation. Say, I have these really strange looking migraines. It looks like I'm having a stroke, but it's not. And here's um, what you need to do in this kind of situation. Um, things like that. So here's kind of a list of um, most of my diagnoses. And as you can see, I started getting diagnosed at the age of 15 with fibromyalgia. And then 10 years, I got two more diagnoses. And 10 years later, I was diagnosed with a genetic disorder called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, type 3. 
hypermobile type, um, which actually Ellers Danlos getting kind of in the news more recently. Miss Virginia has Ellers Danlos a couple years back. Um, there are types that are rare. My type, however, is not rare. Um, it is much more common than people think it is. However, people don't know about it. Um, we don't have, we have very few doctors um, that know about it. And you usually have to leave your state to find out about it or get proper care, um, which causes its own difficulties. Um, so that again, that's why I truly believe advocacy is education. Um, and then if you look, I, I was kept getting diagnoses and diagnoses up till I was 33. And then it stopped again. Um, and uh, apparently I can't do my math because I said 10 year gap, but um, it is only a, let's see if I can do math right now, a five year gap um, until I got my next. Um, but that was a big amount of time for me. And that's when I found out the misdiagnosis of uh, pseudo seizures. I was di misdiagnosed with pseudo seizures when I was 31 um, and told it was all in my head. Um, and it was in my head. It was neurological though, um, not psychological like they told me. Um, I have hemiplegic migraines. Although the the migraine specialist is thinking it it may be mums, which is very very similar to hemiplegic migraines, um, but the reason we know it's migraine is migraine treatments work on me. It's still very difficult to treat. It's in no way perfect, but I'm not paralyzed all day every day, which I was a year ago. Um, but it's going to be a lifelong thing. And that's something a lot of uh, patients with invisible disability, with chronic illnesses, with rare disorders, and particularly women are told it's all in your head. Um, and it's unfortunate because you can't get the right treatment if you're not getting the proper diagnosis. And we do have a horrible um, stigma of mental health and invisible disability mental health in our country. Um, so it's not about, um, it's twofold when you're diagnosed with a mental health issue, when in fact it's a physical issue, you're not getting proper care, but also you're getting mistreated because a lot of patients, um, and having been misdiagnosed with, um, it being psychosomatic, you're extremely mistreated. And I was mistreated for many, many years and had to fight and keep trying to get other people to look at me. So I was finally properly diagnosed. Um, I do wanna let you know, it is okay to do your own health homework. A lot of people are afraid of being considered a hypochondriac, but the internet has changed and has grown. You know, um, there are great resources on the internet to find out about things you've been diagnosed with, but also to research symptoms you're having and kind of glean, could I possibly have this? And look, check out support groups, check out foundations, talk to an advocate at a foundation. That's how I found out I had Ehlers-Danlos was I called their national foundation and told them all of my symptoms. And they said, yes, you should see a geneticist. And then I researched who's the best gen geneticist to see. And I was very fortunate at the time I lived just three or four hours from Cincinnati Children's where um, Dr. Brad Tinkle worked, who's internationally renowned um, for Ehlers-Danlos hypermobile type uh, research. Um, so it's okay to do your own homework. It's impossible for doctors to know all about every single condition. It's just physically impossible. Um, and make sure you have a doctor who listens. They do exist. What I hear from doctors and other people, 
They're too young to have all this. There are babies in the NICU and children in the cancer ward. I am not too young. It's just muscle skeletal pain. Never assume. You or your doctors don't assume. Just to let you know, and I'll tell you more about this coming up, but I had six loose screws in my neck. Six. And I kept being told it was just muscle pain. It's in your head. Just because they don't know the answer and haven't had the test or haven't found the test yet, doesn't mean that it's psychoschematic. Make sure everything is ruled out. You're complex. Yes, I am complex. So are millions of people. You should see someone who specializes in this. If I saw a doctor who specialized in each of my disorders, different parts of my body would live in multiple states. And that is why we have to work with our doctors as a team and find ones that are willing to learn and talk to each other. We're understaffed and we have too many patients. I completely understand and empathize with doctors and nurse practitioners understaffed and having too many patients, especially the traveling physicians and nurse practitioners, because I had that um, this year. And I had to stop one of my nurse practitioners because I wasn't getting the care that I needed. And she came in and she didn't realize that I used the wheelchair because she didn't talk about patient history. She didn't do a thorough exam during her examination. She didn't communicate. The nurse practitioner teams weren't communicating with each other or reading each other's notes. But also my wheelchair was right by the front door that she walked through to come to my room. And I had a rollator there as well, and my cane. She had absolutely no idea. So I stopped her and I said, I, I get this and I empathize with you and I can respect that, but also this is your job. It's your job to know these things. This is my life. So I have to stand up for myself. I have to advocate for myself. And I'm not a bad person for asking for the things that I need and making sure that that I am that those things happen and that I am being taken care of the way I should be. And this is your life. So it's okay that you do too. Just like you would a car or a house. Make sure that your doctor is the right fit for you. Again, this is your life. There are more zebras out there than we think. You're not alone. Return to Cinder. Um, I uh, have to joke about a lot of the things that have happened in my life because that's how I cope. Um, but about 10 years ago, I um, was left by my husband at my mom's. Um, I had no money. <laughs> I had no doctors. I had his insurance for uh, the year of separation, um, but then it was gone. But also we had lived in Ohio and now I was in Virginia. So I was left at my mom's with nothing. And I had a true lack of community support system. Um, just like in Field of Dreams, <laughs> build your support system, good things will follow. And I know that's cheesy, but I like to think that. Um, what makes up your support system? Family, friends, medical team, and community resources. Um, a lot of people with disabilities, and the more I talk to other people with disabilities, you know, I'm realizing I'm not alone and that a lot of people, well, uh, people are frequently left by a partner when they become sick or disabled. There's a very, very high percentage of that, unfortunately. Um, but also, um, not everybody has family um, or friends. You know, when I found myself in a new town, I had friends, but it was friends that I hadn't talked to in years or seen, and they built their own lives and their own uh, things, and they were busy, and a lot of them had kids. 
Um, and, you know, having kids is a full-time job. Um, and then, you know, um, I am an only child, so I didn't have siblings um, that could help. Um, and my family was not very close. And uh, my father did not live close. He actually moved right around that same time to the other side of the state. Um, and my mom has uh, a lot of my conditions are genetic. So um, she, I was very, very lucky to have a roof and help with food. Um, but getting on the phone and um, finding those resources was not something my mom could do. And so that became something I had to do in order to survive. Um, what I found was DLCV. Um, first, I went to Zars. I was determined to try to work, and they actually closed my case. It was closed in Ohio and then closed again here. Um, and my counselor here told me, Christina, you need to find Elizabeth Bourne. Um, and so I sought her out, and she was at DLCV and still is. And she fought for me. And I also learned a lot from her which was wonderful. It was wonderful to kind of learn about the process. And um, I know I harassed too, um, but uh, she, she was always willing to uh, answer my questions and explain things. Cause I'm one of those people, the nerd that I am, the more information I have, the more empowered I feel and the, the, the calmer I feel. Um, and, uh, it's information that, uh, I learned through that process that I help my friends, uh, that I've met online and other places through there. And I also continue to send friends, um, and people that I meet to DLCV, to Elizabeth and, um, other resources. Um, and I'm actually still with DARS, um, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later. Um, also was a client of DBVI um, because I am visually impaired. Um, resources for independent living, um, which I've gone to, um, and then uh, social services, you know, SNAP, Feed More, Meals on Wheels, churches, um, Virginia Housing Authority, and HUD. We really, um, we are in a housing crisis, but those that are on disability um, and have been in poverty um, outside of disability know we have been in a housing crisis for a very long time, um, which uh, I'm very fortunate to have had my mom to go back to, but I'm starting to create my plan for my future of where can I go? Because I um, negotiated housing for myself um, at a, a car apartment complex um, that knocked down their rate for me um, because they had accessible units and I was on disability. However, they got new ownership a year ago. Um, I had to leave and sleep on friends' sofas um, and then eventually wound up back at my mom's. Uh, till further notice. The Butcher of Pakistan, um, or Dr. Durrani. Um, this was my spinal surgeon back when I lived in Ohio. Um, he is a fugitive. He is charged with health care fraud, false statements related to health care matters, mail fraud, and illegal drug distribution. Um, he told me that my neck was so unstable that if I were to get in a car accident, I could get an internal decapitation and die. Um, so I got my neck fused. Come to find out later, my neck is actually congenitally fused from the skull, the base of my skull to the first vertebrae. Um, so as my most recent surgeon has told me, my neck was going nowhere. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, I actually, well, 
let me start at the beginning. Uh, he was recommended to me by um, internationally renowned geneticist working at a top tier children's hospital, along with a dental dentist who specialized in cranial instability with Ehlers-Danlos and TMJ. Um, both said I was at the point of needing surgery and he was the person to go to. So I trusted him, um, trusted both of them, and that made me trust him. Um, but this uh, goes to my point in that doctors are fallible. Doctors are human. Um, and this surgeon actually lied to the medical board. So it's very, very important to get multiple um, opinions. Don't just go see one surgeon. See at least three before any surgery. I have learned that lesson the hard way. Uh, he had a dog in his office. <laughs> uh, and was that was honestly one of the, he was one of the kindest doctors that I've ever met. I, I never saw it coming. Um, I was desperate for help because of pain. And I think people will, um, people do desperate things when they're in pain um, and will listen to any kind of, you know, anything out there. And we really have to take a step back and breathe and protect ourselves and find ways to breathe through the pain um, because we don't want to allow ourselves to be taken advantage of. I think it's very easy as someone with a disability, a chronic illness to be um, taken advantage of um, because um, we so desperately want not to be in pain. We want to be quote unquote normal or live normal lives, happy lives. Uh, what? You know, there's a grieving process that comes with disability, grieving the lives you thought that you would have if you're somebody who becomes disabled later in life. Um, or, you know, uh, for parents uh, with disabled children, it's not grieving, it's grieving. Um, you're still also grieving those things that you envision for yourself as a grandparent or maybe watching your child walk across a stage at graduation or prom or getting married, just like we grieve those things for ourselves. Um, so, um, and it's um, and it's because this world is not yet built to uh, accommodate uh, people with disabilities yet. We've made huge strides, but there's still lots to be done. My uh, surgery was in 2012 in Ohio. When I was returned to sender um, in 2013 in Virginia, I continued to have pain. So I asked for images of my neck and all my doctors said no in Virginia. Local neurologists have a, an agreement that if you see one, you cannot see another. Um, and I was like, well, this, um, I'm not liking the care that I'm getting with this neurologist. I think it's absolutely okay for me to be able to seek a second opinion, if not a third or a fourth. But because of this agreement, I, I faced a lot of um, heat trying to do that. Um, and I still know people that uh, have that problem themselves, but I got three different hospitals to break that rule so I could get different opinions. Um, because it just wasn't working. And I said, this this physician is not working for me. I'm not working for them. I need to be able to see another doctor and get another opinion. Um, and it's it's not about going in, you know, with hatred or or anger. It's it's going and trying to talk to them about what you need. And and just making clear it's not unreasonable to ask for a second opinion. And to deny you that, I think, is actually unreasonable. I had to go on medical leave from grad school uh, a year ago. Um, I, I tried to go back to grad school to pursue my MSW, to be a medical social worker with children. Um, but my neck pain uh, started up really bad. I went to the ER and was told it was just muscle skeletal and to take ibuprofen. Pain management kept sending to me to the ER 
ER kept sending me back to pain management. I finally got an MRI and was told it was all okay, despite the fact that my fusion was blocking their view. When you have um, metal back there, you have to get a CT in order to get the view that they need to see if anything's wrong. I finally got a CT because I kept pushing it. And I, I, you know, I was like, you're not going to get rid of me. Something's going on. Um, two loose screws in my neck. I went to three different surgeons before I found one willing to operate. All the other surgeons were hesitant because of my youth, um, which is what they said. I don't feel young, but because of my youth and the complexities of my conditions. Um, but Dr. Scheimer at UVA agree. He said, as long as you understand that this may not um, like reverse your pain or stop your pain, I'm okay. And I'll do it. And I was like, will it prevent me from damage, like further damage? And he said, yes. And I said, then I'm okay with it. I was like, as long as I know up front that I may continue to live in lifelong pain, but I will prevent further damage, let's get all that out. That's the safe thing to do. Um, and I also felt violated having that in my body. I felt extremely violated. Um, he removed six loose screws. So it wasn't just two, there were six. And he said that two were so loose, he was afraid during surgery, they would touch my spine. They would bump into my spinal column and cause paralysis. So he said, thank God we did that surgery. Checking out AMA or the great escape, as I like to call it. This happened last summer. I was in a, I ended up going to the ER because of a hemiplegic migraine. I had stroke-like symptoms uh, that wouldn't stop. So my roommate, um, we called 911, um, went to the ER, uh, I was admitted. I was also having a really bad trigeminal neuralgia episode, just really painful. Um, and they couldn't, usually when I get the migraine cocktail, I can co walk within 15 minutes, but um, it didn't work. I stayed for a week um, and then all of a sudden, and they're like, you have a fever um, and we think you have shingles and that's what your pain is. And I was like, shingles, but I don't have a rash. Um, and uh, they actually um, put, um, all, everybody had to wear, like, you know, when you watch those movies when there's like an outbreak, everybody had to wear like full, um, uniforms and all this stuff like to protect themselves and they limited the people that could come in and out of my room um uh the funny thing is i did not have shingles i was right but it's because the doctor had misdiagnosed me um i had to wait like three days um for the test results to come back and i kept asking and asking and i was in pain but it it made my hair not as good because I was, um, they couldn't send as many people in and out and they had, because they had to change every time they went in and out. And they were also low on nurses, particularly um, night shift. Night shift and weekends is always like the worst time to go to the hospital. Um, and, and I was like, something is going on. Like my jaw, I woke up morning and my jaw was just killing me and it felt like it was swelling so I talked to the doctor and I told the nurses and um the doctor's like well you know it's probably your TMJ I was like yes I have TMJ um she's like well um okay it's probably your TMJ it'll be fine um a couple hours later I was still in excruciating pain and I was like I know I'm on narcotics that <laughs> I should not be feeling my TMJ right now. Um, so I asked for the nurse. I was like, I need a second opinion. Well, they, I was like, can I get a CT? Do you have any 
oral P if it is TMG, can anybody TMJ, can anybody look at it? They didn't, this particular hospital didn't have anybody that would be able to look at it or the machines to really be able to look at it. And I was like, well, can you send me to the hospital in town that does so I can get, you know, a second opinion? And she's like, no, because it's just your TMJ. We'll wait and later we'll do an, you know, image when that machine like opens up. Um, here's a uh, lozenge. And I was like, huh? Um, she literally gave me a lozenge to put in the inside of my mouth, like right in here, um, you know, because of the menthol. And she said, the menthol, you know, will help. Well, it just got worse and worse and worse. Um, and so like, I even called, I called 911 because I did, I was so desperate. I was in so much pain. I hadn't slept in two nights. I'd actually, um, I have incontinence issues and I had um, wet myself um, in the past two nights, no one had changed me. Um, so I would go the whole night in excruciating pain and not in length in, in my own urine. Um, and no one would change me because they were so short staffed. So I called 911 because I said, um, I need help. I couldn't get the social workers to talk to me. I'd paged for them. I called them. I even had uh, my power of attorney emailing them during the day, trying to get them to come and visit me or talk to me. I was there for five days. Um, but during like this, like they just didn't visit. They wouldn't call to my room. They wouldn't talk to me. So that's when I called 911 and I said, I'm being held against my will. And um, so I was, um, Eventually, I had a friend pick me up and I left AMA or against medical advice, which fortunately I did not have to pay for. But a lot of people do end up having to pay for because their insurance won't cover it if your doctor's orders are for you to stay. It could have also been that I did threaten to sue and I kept calling, you know, and asking for my bill to be um, uh you know, cut because I was like, this is absolute ridiculous care. Um, but my friend picked me up and took me to another hospital in town um, where they immediately diagnosed it as an abscess. That was me when it was looking good. Um, I was like a chipmunk and it swelled up. Um, oh, here's all my notes. That would have been helpful. <laughs> it was very painful. But as soon as they diagnosed it, they drained it um, and kept me overnight on a pain medicine drip and an antibiotic drip. He said, I don't know how you survived this long without pain, medica pain medication. But when you are a chronic pain patient, you have a very high pain tolerance. And it's also your body will do amazing things when it's in that extreme amount of pain. Um, you can survive even when you think you can't. Um, and uh, they drained the abscess, but it was so bad. And they pulled the tooth that a week later, I kept having to go back like two times because they almost had to um, drain my neck. My trip down the stairs. So um, I live now, um, like I said, on a second floor, and I have a um, chair um, that I ride up and down. But when I go into paralysis, we had to call, you know, an ambulance to come and take me to the hospital. And the first time that happened, when they came, you know, I'm dead weight. Um, they dropped me down the stairs. And then one of them fell on top of me. And then I kept having nightmares and um, flashbacks to it to the point where I did not want anybody to send me uh, to the hospital um, while I was living here on the second floor. Um, but it got to that point where it was really 
that again. Um, and uh, my loved ones pled with me and they're like, you know, and I finally, you know, um, just let them uh, call the ambulance. And the people that arrived um, denied having that I was dropped the first time. They invalidated my experience, not just my experience, but those of my family um, and my boyfriend at the time. Um, who had watched in horror as I was dropped down the stairs. And that was very scary for them as well. Um, they also wouldn't let anybody come on the ambulance with me. And when I'm like that, I can't speak. And my eyes also um, uh, spasm shut. So I can't see. Um, so after all of this, I ended up... Um, calling the firehouse and reported the issue. I was going to look at legal steps to take, but I realized that for my own peace of mind, I, it wasn't about money. I want to make sure this never, ever happens to another person or their family again. Um, and I, what, and I, and I really felt like it was about education because they were, um, they need to look at how they're taking somebody down the stairs. They also need to look at how the professionalism of how they speak with family during events like this. And also as someone that can't speak or see um, to advocate for myself, I absolutely am allowed to have somebody ride in the vehicle with me. There's no reason to not have somebody there. Um, so, um, I was able to speak to the people in charge and um, make sure that um, that I was heard and my family was heard in the hopes that this would not happen again. So the podcast, Advocacy and the Future. Um, so here's some Christina-isms, which I may have already thrown in, but things I've learned. Um, that I, in being disabled um, and in self-advocating, you have to learn to be your own best friend. You are with yourself more than anyone else, 24 hours a day from birth to death. You must become your own cheerleader because there will be times when you don't have anyone else. Never apologize for asking for what you need, for advocating to protect yourself and find answers. Surround yourself with people who believe in you. You will lose people, but the good ones stay. Go, going to counseling is a sign of strength, not weakness. Prepare your child with a disability to advocate for themselves so they can when they are an adult. Don't approach every situation as a battle. Stay calm, ask questions, present your needs, but don't be afraid of confrontation if necessary. Learn as you go and pivot, as my friend and co-host Nate would say, you know, adapt. We have peaks and we have valleys. Enjoy the good times when you are in a valley and in, when you are in a valley, remember a good day will eventually come. Find your mantra. Always remind yourself of the worst thing that you have lived through. You survived that. Everything else seems easy. Just because you're homebound doesn't mean you can't socialize. Have Zoom parties and movie nights with your friends. I watch horror movies with people via Zoom. It's hysterical and it helps you forget all the stress and other things you're living through. Join support groups. Just know when to leave when it becomes too negative. There are good people out there that want to help. Seek them out. And then this is what I want to do. I want to help others like I have been helped, you know, like DLCV and DARS, the resources for independent living and some of my caseworkers, you know, um, I'm working on getting my MSW, hopefully. I'm studying to become a board certified patient advocate and continue with this podcast. I'm getting to interview people that have disabilities, to give them a platform to share their story. 
and also with like quote unquote experts in the field um, to talk about certain topics. Like we've had someone from Disability Law Center come and talk about nursing homes and assisted living facilities. We're gonna have someone come on about voting. Um, we've had um, pain um, and acceptance, all kinds of things. Um, and what is disability? So um, I wrote this the other day and on Facebook and I wanted to share it with you because um, it's kind of like my reflection that I think applies here. But um, while I can be frustrated at individuals and organizations, what I take from my experiences is that individuals with disabilities will only get the care they need when change happens at a systemic level. No individual or organization sets out to make it harder for people with disabilities or to destroy their lives. In fact, quite the opposite. The lack of funding, training, and staff make it impossible for them to do what they set out and promise to do. If we want our loved ones, ourselves, to have even basic resources like housing, food, transportation, phone, insurance, we cannot sit back and complain. We have to be a part of making change happen. Volunteer, write organizations and share your insight and experience. Go to the Hill, write your representative. Change can only truly happen if those with disabilities and their loved ones involve themselves in the process. You are not alone. You may feel alone sometimes, but you're not alone. You are a warrior, you are an X-Men. And I, I love this picture of a demon with a little girl. And it says, you wake up every morning to fight the same demons that left you so tired the night before. And that, my love, is bravery. This is our season two title for Speaking in Spoons podcast. You can learn more about the podcast and what uh, I'm working on at www speakingandspoons.com. Thank you uh, for having me. Um, thank you so much, Christina. That was a wonderful presentation. And I can tell you, I learned a lot. I gained a lot of perspective. And I have so much more respect for you and your journey than I even did before. Thank you so much for being so vulnerable and sharing what it is to be a powerful self-advocate. I know that I feel empowered and I know that there are probably lots of people here in this uh, presentation that feel that same way. It looks like we are, um, we have about six minutes left um, of this session. Is there any, let me check the chat and see if there are actually any questions. Um, let's see, Rachel Gloria says, thank you for your bravery. And again, I echo that. This was an amazing presentation. Um, and again, I learned a lot and I hope everyone else did too. Um, if anyone has any questions for Christina, please feel free to come off of mute and ask them or drop them in the chat box and I will be happy to read them aloud for everyone. And also, um, you can contact me on the website, www.speakinginspoons, if we run out of time for any questions. And I apologize about volume. I'm noticing some um some messages. I'm visually impaired, so I was unable to see those during the video. So I apologize for that. Ah, thank you, Hira. It looks like Hira just dropped the link to Speaking in Spoons in the, ch in the chat box. Please go check that out and support Christina on her self-advocacy journey. Um, again, Christina, we thank you so much for being vulnerable, being brave, most of all, being a wonderful 
self-advocate. It takes a lot to advocate for yourself when you have a lot going on. So again, I know I appreciate your story and I hope that so many others here today were touched by it. And we can't wait to hear more from you in the future. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Looks like we have about maybe four or so minutes left. If anyone would like just to hop in, ask a question, feel free. And again, just a reminder um, to anyone here, the materials for this session are on the platform and you can access those. I believe here I'll put them in the chat um, at the start of the presentation. So definitely save this PowerPoint, save this video, um, use it as part of your toolkit and becoming a self-advocate. I know I'm going to refer back to it when I have those rough days. So again, we appreciate you. Um, and it looks like Paul said, I enjoyed this presentation very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. All right, Christina, well, we won't keep you. And like I said, we hope to hear lots from you in the future. And um, from all of us at DLCB, on behalf of the Summit team, thank you again for such a wonderful and empowering presentation. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for having me. Yes, ma'am. Bye, everyone. Bye.